I'm uh, Krishna Ayer from Portis Escort Art Institute, New Delhi. I hope you are able to hear me. Uh, if you have any problems, please enter in the chat box what problem you are having here. So today's topic is the surgical management of transposition of the great arteries. I hope to finish this topic in about 40-45 minutes. So as you're all well aware, the morphology of transposition of the great arteries is that there is a condition where there is atrioventricular concordance, but there is ventricular arterial discordance. So essentially what happens is that the right ventricle is connected to the aorta and the left ventricle is connected to the pulmonary artery, effectively resulting in a circulation that runs in parallel rather than in series. Uh, it is a condition which is relatively uncommon but not that rare, so it constitutes 5 to 7 percent of all congenital heart disease, but it's a condition which is associated with a high infant mortality, so 20 percent of all infant cardiac mortality is as a result of children born with transposition of great arteries. And because the systemic and pulmonary circuits are in parallel, it's incompatible with life unless there is a communication between the two circuits which usually occurs with a patent ductus arteriosus and ASD or a ventricular septal defect. As you are aware, the natural history is quite dismal, but fortunately, timely surgery can alter this poor natural history quite dramatically. And so for that, it's important that the diagnosis is established promptly and a referral to a surgical center which can offer surgical management is done as early as possible. Now, we broadly identify four morphological subtypes of transposition of great arteries. And the commonest one is where there is no intraventricular communication, that means the intraventricular septum is intact, so we call it PGA IVS for short. The patients who have a ventricular septal defect, which is sizable, have a different physiology, we in short call it PGA VSD. And those with an additional left ventricular outflow obstruction in the presence of VSD, which is commoner, uh, these behave in a different manner because they are present with cyanosis and more akin to a tetralogy physiology. And lastly, the rarest subgroup is where there is intact ventricular septum, but in addition, there is left ventricular outflow obstruction. The diagnosis depends largely on a high degree of clinical suspicion. In TGA with IVS, cyanosis presents very early in life and progresses to cardiorespiratory distress or acute collapse when the patent ductus arteriosus closes. The patients with a VSD more often present with symptoms of congestive heart failure, with tachypnea, cyanosis, and failure to thrive, and present at a slightly later time frame. And those, as I mentioned, with TGA, VSD, and pulmonary stenosis have cyanosis, but they're usually stable in early infancy, as I mentioned, present more like patients with tetralogy of fallow than transposition of great arteries. The surgery for transposition has evolved over the last half a century or so. Initial attempts at anatomic correction failed because they were done in older patients when the left ventricle had already regressed and that understanding of the left ventricular physiology was not there those days. And it was not till 1959 that a definitive procedure in the form of an atrial switch procedure was described by Senning. Subsequently, mustard from Toronto in 1964 described a simpler form of the atrial switch where they used a pericardial baffle within the atrium in order to stream the blood flow within the atria. And the anatomical correction was finally then successfully achieved only in 1975 by Abe Jatini from South America. And that really changed the time course and the way the management of transposition of great arteries occurred. Subsequently, in 1977, Jakub introduced the stage arterial switch for patients with transposition and intact ventricular septum who presented late. I must mention here that the initial patients which were operated the arterial switch were all patients who had a ventricular septal defect. And so the left ventricle was prepared. Whereas they still had a problem with patients who had intact ventricular septum who could only be managed by the atrial switch. It was only when Jakub introduced the concept of left ventricular training 
that the arterial switch operation could be applied to patients with transposition and intact ventricular cells. And then, of course, the game changer occurred in 1984 when Catherine Lida from the Boston Children's Hospital described the arterial switch procedure in neonates during the time frame when the left ventricle was still prepared and had not regressed. And that really changed the outcome of patients with transposition of great arteries because it almost totally eliminated the dismal natural history of this condition. And then in 1989, the same group also introduced a rapid two-stage operation for patients who for some reason or the other could not be operated in the neonatal period. So just to diagrammatically show you what is the transposition physiological repair or the atrial switch vis-a-vis -vis the arterial switch. So the figure that you see on the left is what is the morphology of transposition of great artery, that is a situation with ventricular arterial discordance. And the figure in the middle that you see is where you have the atrial switch performed, that is the baffling of the blood flow at the atrial level, so that the left atrial flow now instead of going to the left ventricle, goes to the right ventricle, and the systemic venous return from the right atrium goes to the left ventricle. So in effect, because of the ventricular arterial discordance, the pulmonary venous return now is transferred to the aorta and the systemic venous return is now pumped into the pulmonary artery. Thereby, this in effect corrects the circulatory abnormality so that oxygenated blood from the lung is now reaching the body and the deoxygenated blood is reaching the lungs. And this corrects the circulatory abnormality but does not correct the anatomical abnormality. That means the right ventricle remains a systemic ventricle, which has the potential of failing in the long term. The arterial switch, what you see on the right side, is what is an anatomic correction. And because it's an anatomic correction, what it essentially is, is that the arteries are switched at the arterial level. But in addition to that, the coronary artery which is arising from the aorta and the right ventricle also has to be switched. And that will complete the anatomic correction so that the left ventricle now is corrected to the aorta and the coronaries take origin from the new aorta and the pulmonary artery is connected to the right ventricle. But note from this that this is almost a 99% anatomical correction but the semilunar valves, that means the pulmonary valve remains in the aortic position and the aortic valve remains in the pulmonary position. So that's important to recognize that we transfer the arteries, we transfer the coronary arteries, but we do not transfer the semilunar valves. So a few diagrams to explain to you what the original atrial switch procedure was or the senin procedure. And we do an incision on the right atrium after going on bypass. And when you open the right atrium, you find the fossa ovalis defect. It may be intact. Usually, these patients have a large fossa ovalis defect because they have an intact ventricular septum. So either a naturally occurring or post balloon atrial septostomy. We excise or make incisions in that atrial septum in order to create an atrial septal flap. And then this flap is sutured to the back wall of the left atrium in order to create what is known as a neoceptation of the atrial wall. So this is the way the pulmonary veins are there in the back of the left atrium and this atrial septal flap is turned back into the left atrium and sutured to the left atrial wall in such a way that the pulmonary veins are posterior to this and the mitral valve is anterior to this. And then we make an incision on the right side at the site where the pulmonary veins join the left atrium. So when you open this, then this portion of the pulmonary vein which is lying behind this flap now opens out on into this pericardial cavity here. The next stage is to create the system venous baffle. So the flap of the right atrium which is on the right hand side is now sutured to the atrial septum in front of the ASD. So once that is done, then the SVC flow and the IVC flow now goes to the front portion of that left atrium, which opens into the mitral valve. So now 
once you suture this the systemic venous return is now going into the mitral valve and then when you suture this flap of the right atrium to the pulmonary vein opening you can understand now over the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava on either side like in this fashion so the pulmonary venous return from here now flows around the systemic baffle and into the tricuspid valve so this is the way that the sending procedure establishes an atrial switch what you will find interesting is that most of the surgery is done with the use of the patient's own cardiac tissues so there is almost no foreign tissue that is put in and this is compatible with growth cardiac tissue will grow with age and therefore the sending procedure although may be technically appearing a little complicated but has better long term results because the natural tissues grow with age and the chances of stenosis in any of these pathways is lesser than in the master operation so what are the advantages of this sending procedure one that it is an operation which can be performed with low operative mortality and morbidity and most importantly it can be performed at all ages so it's not dependent upon the whether the ventricle is regressed or not irrespective of the status of the left ventricle since the right ventricle which is a systemic ventricle in this situation remains a systemic ventricle it can be performed at any age that the patient presents and because it's a operation that is less time consuming and more easily learned and less dependent on uh, things like coronary transfer the post operative course is relatively smoother and it less requires less post operative infrastructure because it's done in older patients unlike the arterial switch which is generally performed in the neonatal period and requires much higher infrastructure there's shorter hospital stay and lower cost and therefore it's more acceptable to many situations where the congenital heart surgery is performed by adult surgeons and importantly it has excellent early and mid term results but the important point is that the long term results are what is the concerning area but all these points that i mentioned are issues which are very relevant to developing countries where very often patients present at a much later age than long ago period the disadvantages of the sending procedure are that it's not suitable when there is right ventricular dysfunction or there is significant tricuspid regurgitation because the right ventricle is going to be the systemic ventricle and when the right ventricle is already dysfunctional then these patients are going to have a poor long term outcome and of course the follow up results of these patients now that we have 30 and 40 year follow up of these patients there is a significant proportion of the patients who have arrhythmias mainly related to atrial arrhythmias that's a loss of sinus rhythm it can be supraventricular tachyarrhythmias sudden death is known in patients with pre existing rhythm disorders baffle leaks can occur and these are technical issues but most importantly a uh, number of patients do exhibit features of failure of the systemic right ventricle because systemic the right ventricle is not morphologically designed to function as a systemic ventricle over a long period of time now to move on to what the anatomical repair of transfusion of great arteries is that i had mentioned that the landmark paper was published in 1984 from the boston children's group which demonstrated that if the arterial switch operation was performed in early neonatal period before the left ventricle regressed then these patients could have a successful arterial switch without need for prior preparation so the capacity of the left ventricle in the neonate to effectively take over the systemic circulation was clearly demonstrated in their experience and from that point on a newborn with transposition intact ventricular septum or presence like this significant cyanosis in the first few of days the ideal treatment today is an early arterial switch operation so how do you investigate a baby who presents with a suspicion of transposition of great arteries on would do the routine investigations of electrocardiogram chest x ray uh, oxygen saturation and a blood gas then the anatomic diagnosis is established by a quick and rapid bedside to the echocardiogram very rarely these patients may require a cardiogram cardiac catheterization or a ct angio if the anatomy is not very clear of this some other complex 
issues or their suspicion of collaterals, but importantly in the vast majority of cases a definitive diagnosis can be established on the basis of the and we are well aware that the classical features in transposition is the smooth ventricle which is the left ventricle connecting to a great artery which bifurcates with the pulmonary artery and a rough ventricle which is the right ventricle connects to a non-branching great vessel which is the aorta. So, clearly a ventricular arterial discordance is demonstrated, there is no ventricular septal defect in this situation and we can see very clearly here that there is mitral and pulmonary continuity which is a hallmark in transposition of great, great arteries. So, what is the information that the surgeon requires and which as a cardiologist you need to provide for the surgeon? Importantly, if you go sequentially, you need to see the presence or absence of an ASD, the size and the shunting, the PDA, again its size and shunting, does it have a VSD, is it single or multiple and what is the size and location and then a good assessment of the left ventricle. One needs to see the size of the left ventricle, whether it is apex forming or not. The shape of the left ventricle, whether it is normal shape, which means in cross section is circular, or is it banana shape, which means that the right ventricle is pushing the septum towards into the left ventricle. You need to measure the wall thickness, both in systole and diastole. Calculate the left ventricular volume, the left ventricular mass, and then look at the left ventricular outflow, whether there is any obstruction. And if there is an obstruction, is it of a dynamic nature or a fixed nature? Then the great vessel relationship, if they are normal, obviously the connections we are talking about transposition, so there will be ventricular arterial discordance and, but we need to see whether these, uh, the position of the iota is a D loop or an L loop. And then lastly you need to look at the coronary pattern because that is important for the arterial switch operation. And once the diagnosis is made then one needs to prepare for surgery. And this depends upon if the patient is desaturating and the duct is too patent, one can maintain patency of the duct or improve ductal flow by starting a prostaglandin infusion. And if that does not stabilize the patient, does not bring up saturation, one should proceed for an urgent balloon atrial subcostomy. Of course, this is a situation where the patient is not maintaining adequate saturation and there is no adequate atrial septal defect to start with. And then one would try and do an arterial switch operation within the first three weeks of life, preferably within a few days of the patient being stabilized. And therefore, it is important that early recognition is very crucial because the time frame available to the surgeon is relatively short. So, that is how a balloon atrial septostomy is done. I am sure you are all familiar with this and can talk to you. And that is a balloon which is introduced into across the ASD into the left atrium, the balloon is inflated and pulled down with a sharp tug and so this is the sort of flap that you see in a patient with transferring intact septum, the ASD communication is not very big and after a septostomy one can have a fairly wide communication. So, a few diagrams to show what an arterial switch operation steps are, you can see here that is transposition, the iota is in front, pulmonary artery behind. The coronary arteries are coming from the base of the aorta here and then one transects both the arteries and then you explant the coronary arteries from the aortic root. So, that is the ostium of the coronary artery, one excises a cuff of the aortic wall along with the coronary artery and then this has to be swung back, rotated and attached to the pulmonary artery which is lying posteriorly after creating defects at appropriate sites. So, this is the most crucial part of the arterial switch operation, this is called the coronary transfer. So, there is rotation of the coronary artery and this. Now, if this rotation is not done adequately and it is not sighted properly, then there is potential for coronary artery kinking or coronary artery occlusion and in that case the patient will have left ventricular failure and will not survive. So, this is the most crucial aspect of the pulmonary artery switch operation and the next step is then to bring the pulmonary artery bifurcation forwards in front. So, that it can be anastomosed to the old aortic stump, the gap left by the explantation of the coronary is filled with pericardium and then the pulmonary artery reconstruction is done. So, this maneuver is called the Lecomte maneuver. The Lecomte maneuver essentially results in the 
pulmonary artery bifurcation coming in front. So when you do a post-operative echo, you will not see the pulmonary artery bifurcation in its usual location. The ascending aorta goes behind the pulmonary artery bifurcation, and then the ascending aorta is sutured to the old pulmonary artery stump, which becomes the neo-aortic stump, and which now houses the coronary arteries. The important technical issue as I mentioned, the coronary transfer is the most important, and there are several technical maneuvers that one does to establish the coronary transfer. The site where the coronary is placed in the pulmonary artery can be a trapdoor type of mechanism, can be a punch hole, it can be vertical slits. These are basically surgical technicalities. But more importantly, is that the left ventricle is extremely fragile in these patients because the left ventricle has not faced a systemic circulation and this if not managed appropriately in the post operative period can fail and can lead to mortality and some of the maneuvers that we establish is that we do not acutely subject this left ventricle to a severe afterload so you need to keep the afterload reduced as far as possible so that the left ventricle slowly gets used to an afterload we maintain low la pressure that means again you don't volume load this ventricle and produce acute distension because some of these ventricles are still thin walled and they need to hypertrophy over course of time. So you use a mixture of dilators and inotropic agents or inodilators and because these patients have a very limited reserve of stroke volume, we try and manage and compensate that with very high heart rate. So it's important to be familiar with the coronary anatomy in this patient because that affects the way that one creates the coronary transfer during the arterial switch operation. And the description is usually depending upon the sinus of origin and which coronary artery is coming from what sinus. And the laden classification is what is most popularly used. And the way one gives the laden classification is that you take a cross section, this being anterior and this being anterior and posterior. If you assume that a person is standing in the non coronary sinus and facing the pulmonary artery, then the sinus to the left is known as 1, the sinus to the right is known as sinus 2 and whichever artery is arising from that sinus then that is depicted as. So here is a situation which is standard where the left and the circumflex are arising from sinus 1 and the right is arising from sinus 2 so we call it 1LX, 1LCX, 2R and likewise here is a situation where it is 1L, 2RCX, the second most commonest situation and the third situation where there is sort of an inverted loop, so the circumflex is coming from sinus 1 and the LAD and right comes from sinus 3. The more rarer variety which is also encompasses the single coronary pattern group and single coronary pattern you can either have two separate openings which are very very close to each other so that you cannot harvest them as two buttons or you can have a single coronary artery coming and then giving rise to all the three branches. The single coronary artery in early days used to be associated with the higher mortality because of coronary artery issues but with experience now the risk of a single coronary artery remains the same as for a dual coronary artery system. And with good echocardiographic imaging one can identify these type of coronary arteries so that generally a surgeon is not faced with a sudden surprise in the operating table. And the arterial switch operation is now an operation which is well established and most centers would have an extremely low operative mortality, have written a figure of 5 percent which is general but many good centers have brought down the mortality to as low as less than 1 percent. All coronary types can be switched in today's age, especially patients with intramural coronary arteries also can be effectively switched. So there is no patient who cannot undergo uh, arterial switch operation on the basis of coronary anatomy. The intermediate survival is also excellent. We have figures now of survival of almost 30 years plus. But there are some concerns about the long term survival. And the survival concerns are basically related to whether the left ventricle will function as in a normal patient over an entire lifetime and the concern is in patients who have had left ventricular retraining and then had a subsequent arterial switch. The concerns about possibility of coronary osteostenosis and whether these patients will be more prone to atherosclerosis in later life 
There is evidence that the left coronary system may be mildly hypoplastic as compared to normal patients. And so if these patients develop atherosclerosis, then they are likely to develop features of coronary occlusion much earlier than normal patients. And of course, there are some concerns that the neo-aortic root, which is, as I mentioned earlier, remains the morphological pulmonary valve, but the over course of time, this is likely to dilate and produce aortic vegetation. So just some of the survival curves, as I mentioned, this is from a very early series, but even in that early series, you could see that after an initial mortality, which was high in the early days, but no longer so, you can see that the survival plateaus off. That means there's practically no late mortality in patients after an arterial switch procedure, whereas the upper curve, which is for an atrial switch procedure, still has a slow regression of survival as you follow up with patients. With respect to clinical picture, to give you an idea, this is an arterial switch performed in a baby who was 10 days old in 1990s, one of our patients. In the same patient after 14 years, you can see leading a fairly normal life. And that's what you see on a CT angio for post-operative follow-up of the patient. You can see this. This is a Lecomte maneuver. The pulmonary artery, as I mentioned, pulmonary bifurcation lying in front of behind. And you can see the two coronary arteries neatly coming off from that neo aorta. But as I mentioned, the arterial switch operation is ideally performed in the neonatal period, and that is what happens in most of the industrialized or developed countries. But in many developing countries, of the so-called non-industrialized countries, the diagnosis is often delayed and for many reasons which can involve social situations or financial situations, patients do not come for surgery within that critical neonatal period. So when they present late, then is an arterial switch operation possible or is it ideal and if not, what are our other options? Now we know that the physiology of the left ventricle in the situation of transposition is that over the first few weeks of life, because the left ventricle is connected to the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary circulation, which is a low pressure circuit, it has a much lower afterload than when it's connected to the systemic circuit. This results in a lower intraluminal left ventricular pressure, which leads to left ventricular decondition. And when this deconditioning persists over a period of time, that leads to an actual regression of left ventricular mass. And this is a time-related event. And it is generally observed that beyond four, four to six weeks, that this regression of left ventricular mass appears at a more rapid rate. But many situations, even at late presentation, the left ventricle may not have involuted. And this happens in some situations where there's failure of regression of neonatal pulmonary vascular resistance, so the left ventricle remains prepared. If there is a dynamic or left resectable left ventricular outflow, then the LV may remain prepared. If there is a large PDA, then there is sufficient volume loading and increased PA pressure. If there are large iotopulmonary collaterals again, there is increased pulmonary blood flow and resultant increase in PA pressure may lead to a preservation of the left ventricle. And sometimes if the ASD is restrictive and there is a small PDA, in that situation also, the left ventricle may not regress. In these situations, one has the opportunity of doing an arterial switch operation even later. But if that situation does not exist, then there is a time-related increase in the risk of mortality following an arterial switch procedure. And in the early days, when the Congenital Heart Surgeon Society presented their data in 1988. They stated that beyond the age of two weeks, there's an incremental increase in the risk of mortality if an arterial switch was performed. And that mortality became significant if it was performed over 30 days of age. But mind you, this was early experience with the arterial switch. This is 1988. But then the situation over course of time has changed. But it's important to realize how do we identify that a left ventricle is regressed and it's not likely to face a systemic circulation. It's still an area which is debated upon. But then by and large, one would accept that if on echo, the left ventricular shape is banana shaped rather than circular and the interventricular septum moves with the right ventricle rather than the left ventricle, 
if the left ventricular posterior wall thickness is less than 3 millimeters and if the left ventricular mass is less than 35 grams per meter squared and if there is low left ventricular end diastolic volume on echo then all these features would suggest a regressed left ventricle. The hemodynamic parameters that are important if a patient is undergoing catheterization or a balloon atrial septostomy and the pressures are checked at that time, then if the left ventricle to right ventricular pressure ratio is less than 0.7, then that's a situation which may not be considered suitable for an arterial switch. And some people have tried an intraoperative response to a trial PA banding for a few minutes, 10 to 15 minutes intraoperatively and see the response to the left ventricle. But by and large, one largely goes, experienced surgeons would generally go by what the visual appearance of the left ventricle is on a 2D echocardiogram and then take a call of that. So a regressed to left ventricle generally would look like this. You see on the left hand picture, the long axis of the left ventricle, it's banana shaped. And if you see on the short axis, the intraventricular septum is going into the left ventricle. The left ventricular wall is thin and the left ventricular volume is much less than the right ventricular volume. So these are features which do suggest a regressed left ventricle. So when you have a patient with a regressed ventricle, what are our surgical options? If you are keen on doing an arterial switch operation, then one has to retrain the left ventricle. If you don't want to do an arterial switch operation, one can straight away proceed to an atrial switch operation, which I mentioned to you earlier is not dependent upon left ventricular preparation because the right ventricle remains a systemic ventricle seed. But then how do you retrain the left ventricle? If you want to retrain before doing the arterial switch operation, then you need to do what is known as a pulmonary artery bandage which is in a similar situation for decreasing pulmonary blood flow. Here the banding is not done to decrease pulmonary blood flow but to increase the afterload to the left ventricle. And when you do that, you will be cutting down pulmonary blood flow. So you need to augment pulmonary blood flow by adding a BP shunt. Sometimes if the PDA is small but uh, recanalizable, then one can also do a PDA stenting which again increases the pulmonary blood flow and increases the afterload, uh, the preload to the left ventricle. The afterload would be increased by the increased pulmonary blood flow and therefore that may lead to left ventricular separation. You can also train the ventricle after performing the switch. But in that case, one has to be prepared that the left ventricle may fail immediately. One can support the left ventricle pharmacologically if there is borderline failure. But if there is severe failure, then one needs to recourse, take recourse to mechanical support, which can be in the form of a left ventricular assist or in the form of extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So one can do what is called as a delayed primary arterial switch. I'll dilate upon that in the next few slides. But one has to have the mechanism for backup of mechanical support. So what is the staged arterial switch? I mentioned, which was originally described by Yaku. He introduced the concept of left ventricular training by putting a band around the pulmonary artery and increasing the left ventricular artery. But when he described it, he did the initial first stage and then followed it up with the second stage after several months. And what happened in the interim was that because of the PA band, there was significant dilatation of the pulmonary artery root, and after this arterial switch, these patients developed significant near aortic regurgitation. There were more adhesions and technical difficulties were more. There was need for main pulmonary artery reconstruction because of the band and a significant number of these patients had post-operative left ventricular dysfunction. And therefore, that procedure was largely abandoned. But it was resurrected again by the Boston Children's Group who discovered in their experimental studies that the infant myocardium responded much faster to increase in afterload. And so instead of a PA band in these patients, the left ventricle could be prepared not in a matter of weeks, but in fact in a matter of days. And so they evolved the rapid two-stage arterial switch operation, which was the initial paper was published by Jonas in 1989. But the first stage was a placement of a BT shunt and a PA bank. And then they closely monitored the left ventricle echocardiographically. And the interval phase, the left ventricle hypertrophied, 
and after the hypertrophy of the left ventricle had occurred when second stage was performed in which the band was taken down shunt was taken down and an arterial switch operation was performed so this is what happens with the regressed left ventricle you place the band and then the left ventricle because of the afterload increase actually dilates but here the wall is still thin so the ventricle dilates more than normal but in that period the hypertrophy of the ventricle process starts and after 7 to 9 days the ventricle actually hypertrophies the ventricular volume comes down a bit and then when you do the arterial switch at this stage the ventricle very rapidly normalizes both in volume as well as shape so that is the principle of the rapid two stage arterial switch operation the advantages are over the sending operation that aids in anatomic correction it's technically easier than the delayed two stage because you're doing the second operation within 7 to 9 days so there are no adhesions which form the pa band is in place only for a short duration and therefore it does not destroy the pulmonary artery and does not distort the aortic root the entire operation both stages are performed in a single hospital stay which is easier for the families and then as compared because it's an anatomic correction one would assume that it provides better long term results than the atrial switch the disadvantages of course are the costs multiply because it's much longer hospital stay as well as icu stay and because it requires a lot more fine tuning interval period there is greater morbidity and mortality and the long term performance unfortunately was not as up to expectations as one would assume it and so because of that the concept of the late primary arterial switch development as people started doing slightly older and older patients it was realized that the earlier concept that the arterial switch has to be performed within the first two weeks was not entirely true and the initial experience came from the great ormond street group or and all published their initial results in patients 37 patients who had their arterial switch between 21 61 days and they found that the mortality was actually comparable in fact lower in the older group with equal recourse to mechanical support and there were other groups which published results at the same time davis et al from melbourne david et al from europe and in these patients also it was shown that in a selected patient the arterial switch operation could be performed much later than the neonatal period and the great ormond street group again extended their experience further and they published their result in circulation with 105 patients of late aso performed up to 6 months of age again showing no difference in mortality after load reduction is the mainstay in these patients as mentioned the mainstay of after load reduction is a drug which we use called phenoxybenzamine which is an alpha blocking agent but in the absence of that one could also use other drugs like dexamethasone and mylrinone and in combination with an inotropic agent which is also an inodilator like dobutamine the left ventricle can be managed fairly effectively in most of these patients so importantly one tries to achieve low mean arterial pressure but trying to see that the systemic perfusion is maintained by effective vasodilatation In addition, one may have to resort to adjuvant pharmacotherapy. It's important to maintain a good balance of calcium. Steroids are helpful in physiological doses. Thyroxine supplementation is this evidence of hypothyroidism. And after extubation, these patients benefit from varying periods of non-invasive ventilatory support in the form of nasopharyngeal CPAP. So this is how the patients behave after a rapid two-stage or a, a, sorry, a delayed primary arterial switch. There is an initial phase where the left ventricle has to retrain pharmacologically. There are high heart rates, which can be in the range of 200. The mean arterial pressure is low. The left atrial pressure tends to climb. And after a period of adjustment, which usually takes three to four days, these gradually settle down. The heart rate settles. The mean arterial pressure improves. The left atrial pressure comes down. And then these patients achieve normality. So this is how the echo looks. you can see this regressed left ventricle a banana shaped left ventricle which is thin walled and then you do a primary arterial switch and you can see the immediate response it is very significant tachycardia the ventricle is dilated and thin walled but over the course of 3 4 days this ventricle prepares itself and normalizes and so in our own experience when we compare two groups 
of late arterial switch in primary uh, the, the arterial switch group as well as patients under the neonatal the mortality was comparable in both groups so to summarize therefore for patient presence with intact ventricular septum beyond the neonatal age period then our surgical options are an atrial switch procedure for which the left ventricle does not have to be prepared one can do a stage atrial switch as the way yakub described it and do a rapid two stage atrial switch the way the boston children's group described it or one can do a delayed primary atrial switch keeping a left ventricular assist device or an ecmo as a backup to the left A few words about the other situations of transposition with ventricular septal defect. As I mentioned, as you can see here, there is transposition with a ventricular septal defect. This left ventricle remains prepared. It's maintaining its normal circular shape. The interventricular septum is not going into the right ventricle, and you can see that the left ventricular wall thickness is prepared. So in this situation. the treatment is fairly straightforward you can do an arterial switch operation and close the ventricular septal defect and these patients because the left ventricle is prepared well they do not give the usual problems on left ventricular failure that you can see in the intact ventricular septum so the recommendation is that you patients with transposition ventricular septal defect you do an arterial switch operation with a vat closure at presentation but preferably within 6 weeks of life because after that one does get problems with pulmonary arterial hypertension in the post operative period and if it is delayed then these patients develop pulmonary vascular disease and then if one does an arterial switch in that situation then mortality can be higher these patients are generally inoperable beyond 6 months of age and therefore beyond this age one has to very critically assess each patient to evaluate the operability and in the patient beyond 6 months of age one takes a decision for operability based on whether there is cardiomegaly and chest x-ray pulmonary plethora and if the spo2 on whom air exceeds 85% these are all situations or parameters which would indicate that the pulmonary blood flow is still significant and therefore pulmonary vascular disease probably has not set in cardiac catheterization generally is not very reliable in the situation of transposition to define operability patients with pulmonary stenosis and a vsd as i mentioned they behave like fallows these patients the final or definitive treatment involves some form of a right ventricle to pulmonary artery connection with the use of a conduit or non conduit procedure so the corrective procedure is either a rastelli or a wave procedure or a nikaido i will show diagrams of this and because these procedures involve placement or potential placement of rv to pa conduit they are preferably performed in early childhood maybe at the age of 2 to 3 years and so when these patients present in infancy they have to be palliated and the most common means of palliation is a veil of cosec shunt so a few diagrams to illustrate what's a rastelli procedure so in a rastelli procedure essentially one opens the right ventricle and you resect the obstructive muscle in the subaortic conus and you place a ventricular septal defect patch in such a way it's a large patch which is tunnel shaped so the left ventricle is rooted through the vsd into the aorta so you establish left ventricle to aorta continuity with the use of a large vsd patch and then you establish pulmonary artery to right ventricular continuity by a closing off the pulmonary artery stem and placing a conduit a valve conduit from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery so this placement of the conduit with the intracardiac routing the combination is known as the rastelli procedure this conduit can be of various types and we won't go into the details of that because it's relevant but just to show a diagrammatic picture of what a conduit looks like so this is what is known as a contegra conduit which is placed from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery that's the aorta which is actually lying in front which appears to be connected to the rv but now after the surgery has been through an intracardiac route is connected to the left ventricle the other procedure which is performed is also known as the rev procedure it's a french name a reparation al attach and this is pretty much uh, similar to that of the rastelli except that we try and avoid a conduit so in this case the intracardiac routing is done in similar fashion 
But like in an arterial switch, you do a Lecomte maneuver and bring the pulmonary artery bifurcation forwards. And after bringing the pulmonary artery bifurcation forwards, you directly anastomose the back wall of the pulmonary artery to the right ventricular uh, incision. And you reconstruct the front wall with a patch of pericardium, and one can incorporate a monocast valve in this. And therefore, as you can see here, it's natural tissue to tissue connection. You don't require an artificial conduit. And the supposition is that these patients may not require reoperation for conduit stenosis. A further modification of the rare procedure is not known as the Nikaido procedure. This is a more complicated procedure. So you actually translocate the aortic root posteriorly onto the pulmonary artery root. So you excise the entire aortic root from the right ventricle, and after you excise the pulmonary artery root from posteriorly, in the situation which is more relevant to patients with a non-committed ESC, so you enlarge the left ventricular outflow tract, and after you enlarge that, you move the aortic root posteriorly, suture it. To the left ventricular outflow tract. If there's a VSD, you close the VSD, and then the same maneuver as the rare procedure. You bring the pulmonary artery forwards and connect it to the right ventricle and establish a right ventricle to pulmonary artery continuity to use of a pericardial patch. So to summarize, therefore, management of PGA mandates that you have an early diagnosis, so that's crucial to optimal outcome and proper surgery. Diagnosis should be considered in every newborn who presents with cyanosis and establish diagnosis rapidly with the use of a PD echo, which remains the most valuable and crucial diagnostic method. So thank you very much for your attention. If there are questions now, I'll be happy to answer. Please use your chat box. Any questions from anybody? Uh, what is the role of on table retraining? Now, on table you can't retrain because for retraining you require time. What the paper which was published by Debritz et al. is not on table retraining, but on table assessment of the response of the left ventricle to an increase in afterload. So, what they did on the table was to place a pulmonary artery band and tighten the PA band and observe whether the left ventricle acutely failed or not. If the patient did not demonstrate an acute failure of the left ventricle, then they assumed that this patient would tolerate an arterial switch procedure. Any more questions then? The option was TGA IVS with non resectable. So that's an interesting question because TGA IVS with non resectable LVOTO is a difficult situation. In this situation, you are forced to leave the right ventricle as a systemic ventricle. So the options are that one can do a sending procedure, an atrial switch, and then put a conduit from the left ventricle to the pulmonary artery. That's one option. And the second option is that these are the patients who are suitable for what I described as the Nikaido procedure. In the Nikaido procedure, one actually can enlarge the left ventricular outflow by incising into the interventricular septum, and these patients can be corrected with a Nikaido procedure, although 
that would involve a much greater potential for mortality and morbidity. So it's a trade-off between trying to restore the left ventricle to the systemic circulation vis-a-vis uh, -vis retaining the right ventricles. So the options are two, uh, atrial switch with a left ventricle to pulmonary artery conduit or a Nikaido procedure with a right ventricle to pulmonary artery conduit. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us. I hope it was useful.